The environment and reproduction, what you need to know about your fertility. Hi friends, I am Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. And today I am talking all about the environment, the things you're exposed to, and what you need to know. Specifically, I am going over this article right here, Before the Beginning, Environmental Exposures and Reproductive and Obstetrical Outcomes. This is a review, meaning it was published in our leading journal, Fertility and Sterility, and it encompassed tons of studies. So it put together all these different studies on individual environmental exposures and came up with some conclusions and recommendations for us if you are trying to get pregnant and what you need to know about your environment. This was published in 2019. First of all, if you like learning about your fertility, I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel. That helps me spread my message of fertility education and awareness to others. This topic got a lot of interest with this article that came out. So this was in The Guardian and it says, Shauna Swan, most couples may have to use assisted reproduction by 2045. And this was an interview with her and she has written this book called Countdown, talking about the elimination of the human race, natural fertility wise, based on the environment of what we're exposed to. I have linked this review in the show notes, so feel free to go check it out yourself. 117 studies are cited. So this is quite, quite comprehensive. First thing we're going to go over is mercury. So mercury is actually a neurotoxin, which means it can accumulate in the brain. It can cause cerebral palsy, blindness, mental retardation, and other neurological issues. Now it is a byproduct of like coal production and industrial waste. It also is found in fish. And that's one of the biggest exposures. So even in studies when pregnant women had their mercury levels drawn, even low levels of mercury were associated with reduced IQ development in their offspring or their kids. And this is because mercury does cross the placenta and so it can accumulate in the fetus if you consume mercury while you're pregnant. And when it comes to fish, the big fish eat the little fish. And so the bigger types of fish that you consume if you eat fish, I'll put you at higher risk. So let's go over some of the recommendations. Screen all patients for exposure to mercury by asking about exposures. The US EPA recommends pregnant women, reproductive age women, and young kids eat fish lower in mercury once or twice per week. Pregnant and breastfeeding women should avoid, here's the avoid list, king mackerel, shark, swordfish, marlin, orange ruffy, tile fish, and tuna. You guys, I don't eat fish, but that seems like a lot of fish to avoid. If you are gonna consume seafood, pick those lower in mercury, such as shrimp, salmon, pollock, and catfish. So the next compound to talk about is lead. Lead is a heavy metal, and prior to 1978, it was used in a lot of houses, like in paint. So if you are living in an older house, you are at risk to be exposed. So this 1960 ranch style that I have right here, this is a high risk house. Or there can even be jewelry, pottery, toys that have lead in them. And lead has been shown to have a whole slew of adverse outcomes. Gestational hypertension, so high blood pressure pregnancy, preterm birth, miscarriage, birth defects, and abnormalities of the placenta. There's also been intellectual developmental dislay in children who had high lead levels. And lead, like mercury, can pass through the placenta. Children actually get screened by their pediatrician for lead exposures, and so that's standard practice. So we need to be actively thinking about eliminating this. So what are the recommendations? For women of reproductive age and children, inquire if they have exposure to lead in parental occupation or live in a house built before 1978, especially if undergoing renovation. So cadmium is the next. It is a heavy metal found in batteries, paint, and plastic. It can actually be found from sewage and leaking through the soil into our food supply. Also, tobacco smoke has cadmium, so smokers utter increased risk. Even when we look at IVF studies, patients who had higher cadmium levels in their blood had lower fertilization and lower implantation rates, even with IVF. Men who had high cadmium levels had lower sperm quality and lower testosterone levels. It's an endocrine disruptor. It can disrupt how your body processes and may mimic estrogen. It can cause irregular cycles and decreased fertility. Recommendations. Asking patients about their work environment and smoking habits, including secondhand smoke, can give insights if they're at risk for cadmium exposure. If patients live near an active mine, smelting, or industrial areas, they may have increased risk for exposure. Encouraging to buy organic rice and produce, especially root crops, so potatoes, celery, root, carrots, 
and avoid organ meats while trying to conceive or get pregnant is recommended. Okay, next, pesticides, another big one. Over a billion pounds of pesticides are used in the U.S. every year. I mean, that number is pretty mind-blowing. Many persist in our environment for a long time, in the air, the soil, the water, our food. And if we went and tested the population, over 90% of people would have detectable levels in their blood kind of scary. Pesticide exposure has been linked to a lot of different reproductive and developmental outcomes. So we see higher rates of intrauterine growth restriction and low birth weight when pregnant women had higher pesticide levels. We saw decreased IQ in children born to moms who had higher pesticide levels when they were pregnant. High pesticide levels, preconception and in pregnancy have been linked to certain cancers, including brain tumors and leukemia. There have also been correlations between high pesticide exposure and miscarriages and pregnancy loss. All right, so this is scary, but what are the recommendations? Ask patients about the use of pesticides and insecticides at home or on pets. To reduce pesticide exposure, encourage patients to choose organic fruits and vegetables, especially for the dirty dozen. So things like grapes, plums, peaches, string beans, potatoes, kale, strawberries, apples, pears, spinach, celery, and peppers. That's the Dirty Dozen list. You can always find more about that on the Environmental Working Group, which is ewg.org. Next is the group of EDCs or endocrine disrupting chemicals. On a whole, these chemicals impair our normal reproductive system and how our brain and our organs communicate to each other with signals called endocrine hormones. We're going to talk about the top three, which is going to be BPA, phthalates, and polybrominated diethyl ethers, PBDEs. There's definitely more than this, and even in fellowship, I did some of my research on PFCs or perfluorinated chemicals, and they are another player as well. So population-based data has demonstrated exposures to these chemicals in almost all reproductive age women in the United States. You can be exposed to these from food processing and packaging, from products that you use, whether it is bathroom products or kitchen utensils or products, or overall plastic exposure and use. In utero, exposure to these chemicals, meaning baby exposed while mom was pregnant, has been associated with birth defects, neurodevelopmental outcomes, and thyroid abnormalities. Okay, so BPA is a big one that a lot of people have heard about. We know that it's in plastics, but it's also in receipts. So those thermal receipts that you get, the lining of your canned goods, and epoxy resins. It can even be found in baby bottles and baby toys, things that babies use all the time that are plastic, cell phones, food and drink containers. BPA has been shown to decrease egg quality, implantation, embryo development, and placental function. In a mice study, higher levels of BPA were associated with an increase in aneuploid or genetically abnormal embryos. High BPA levels have been associated with miscarriage. High BPA levels have been associated with lower eggs retrieved in an IVF cycle. High BPA levels have been shown to decrease fetal birth weight and increase IUGR, BPA does cross the placenta. High BPA levels have also been associated with lower sperm counts. So across the reproductive spectrum, female fertility, male fertility, and early in utero development, BPA is a really big player. We have to be careful because a lot of things now say BPA-free, and they're actually just replaced with a different biphenol. So instead of biphenol A, they may have S or a different one. We need to be very careful about these things that BPA was used for and trying to avoid them in our environmental exposures. So the recommendations. Ask patients about their diet and use of plastic drinking and food containers. Educate patients to limit plastic, especially reheating in microwaves or switching from plastic to glass or stainless steel. Avoid taking cast registers receipts printed on thermal paper. Who even talks about this? During preconception, pregnancy, lactation, avoid canned foods, bottled water with the number seven stamped on the bottom. Next up, let's talk about phthalates. Phthalates are a synthetic plasticizer. It's found a lot in beauty care and home care products, and then also in food packaging and dining containers, body lotions, toys, cosmetics. So phthalate exposure has been associated with an increased prevalence of endometriosis, may be involved in the pathogenesis of that disease. Higher phthalate levels have been associated with preterm birth. Also in patients undergoing IVF, this is the EARTH study, a very big population-based study. Higher phthalate level was associated with a lower number of eggs retrieved, lower pregnancy rates, and a higher risk of pregnancy loss. In men, Higher phthalate levels have been associated with decreased sperm counts, increased time to pregnancy, and lower birth weight babies, even with IVF. And if we look at children being exposed, we see earlier ages of puberty for girls and reduced testosterone in boys in some animal-based studies, and this may be because it mimics estrogen. So recommendations. To reduce exposure to phthalates, couples should replace plastic bottles with glass or stainless steel, avoid reheating in plastic containers, 
Choose fragrance free when shopping for personal care products, laundry detergents, or cleaning supplies. Couples should be encouraged to cook food at home and reduce the amount of fast food and processed food. I also like to say don't cook in Teflon that does have PFC exposure. And if you order takeout, take it out of the takeout container immediately and put it into your traditional, your regular glass or dishware. Polybrominated diethyl ethers is next, PBTEs. These are flame retardants. So they're found on textiles, fabrics, furniture, carpeting, and some electronics. They've also been found in fish. Other major exposures are from dust or environmental exposures brought in shoes and outerwear. So babies who had higher PBDE exposure when they were in utero were smaller for gestational age, lower birth weight, higher rates of premature birth, and stillbirth. They've also been associated with thyroid abnormalities in pregnant people and an increased risk of pregnancy loss. In children, PBDE exposure impairs IQ and developmental outcomes, including a poor attention span. Recommendations. Ask patients about their occupation, whether they're exposed to new furniture or textiles. Women and men of reproductive age should avoid purchasing new furniture, carpets, or curtains containing PBDEs when attempting conception or during pregnancy. Also, children should be kept away from newly upholstered furniture containing PBDEs. These are flame retardants, remember. Air pollution is the last thing covered in this review. High levels of air pollution exposure have been associated with an increase in miscarriage, preterm birth, low birth weight, and stillbirth. The LIFE study, which is the longitudinal investigation of fertility in the environment, showed that exposure to air pollution had a 12 to 13 percent increase in the risk of miscarriage. The thought is that air pollution may impair the functioning of the placenta, and it's also been associated with lower IQ levels in children who are exposed during the pregnancy period. Another big review also revealed lower fertility rates to people who had higher exposure to air pollution. Recommendation. Although it's hard to control your living conditions, it may be beneficial to avoid outdoor activities when air quality is poor. Try to avoid areas with heavy traffic or traveling during rush hour and use a HEPA filter inside the home, which we're all much more familiar with with COVID world, and try to reduce chemicals from air pollution. In conclusion, this is a lot of information can be very overwhelming. The chemicals reviewed in this study are things that we're exposed to in our everyday living. I want to impact that you can make small changes that can be very beneficial to how your body functions and how it makes hormones. It doesn't have to be overwhelming, doesn't have to be very doomsday-ish, but the things that we're exposed to on a daily basis do impact how our bodies function and we should at least be aware of this and make changes as we can. Obviously, we need some public policy to help regulate chemicals in the United States, but that's a secondary matter. So at the current time, you need to take charge of your own reproductive health and you need to be aware of the toxins in your environment and how to reduce exposure. Thank you guys so much for following along and for listening. I know this was a long episode, just a lot to cover. As always, you can get more information on the As A Woman podcast or you can follow at Natalie Crawford MD on Instagram. Thanks, friends.